the Bible. It's God's word, right? But what's it really all about? All the stories, all the verses. Here's a thought. Did you know that there's a thread that runs throughout Scripture? A storyline that begins in the beginning and ends at the end. Here, I'll show you. You know in the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the world and He saw that it was good. The sun, the moon, the animals. Then He made man and woman. He made them to live with Him in the garden. But they sinned. And their sin created a separation between them and God. But God had a plan. A plan that was bigger than Adam and Eve. God had a plan to call a people for himself. And through these people, to bless all people. The Israelites were God's chosen people. But sin wasn't done messing things up. God's people turned from them. But like I said before, God had a plan all along. This is where Jesus comes in. The little baby boy born in a manger. The man doing the miracles and preaching and teaching. This man, this Jesus, would give his life on the cross as a once and for all payment for our sins. And this payment would forever break down the wall of sin and guilt that separates us from God. Jesus' sacrifice made right the relationship between God and humans. Scripture says one day he'll return to finally redeem all of his children ushering in an eternal reign from heaven's throne. And from that day on, all nations will join in an eternal song of worship to God. Oh, and you know that thread we talked about? The thread that ties all this together. That thread is love. God's unfailing love for all humankind. A love big enough to seek the redemption and reconciliation of all people throughout all time. A love big enough for the whole world. A love big enough for you. It is a cool story. And it's all right here. So if you want to know more, go ahead. Pick it up. The thread is waiting. All right, so that's our task. The next nine months, we're going to follow this thread where it starts in the very beginning and goes through the whole, throughout the story of Jesus and unravel this big story, find our place in it. So it starts with, uh, the Bible begins with the beginning. That's what the word Genesis means. It simply means the beginning. Um, and that's where this large, overarching story uh, begins. But it comes to us in lots of different ways. Uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis um, are what we call origin stories, all right? So you, you see on our, on our map over here, it's prehistoric. doesn't, you know, I, I always think dinosaurs, but pre, it just means before recorded history, we have this event called creation. And so the way this thing works, there, we have sort of a timeline. We've got events that happen. We've got people that happen. And then the book of the Bible where you find it. And so we're going to start with prehistory. The event is creation. The main characters, Adam and Eve. The book where we find it is Genesis. Um, these are stories that, that talk about ultimate things. They're not necessarily literal descriptions of things as they happen, but they're rich, powerful stories filled with uh, symbols and metaphors to help us understand who we are as people. Where did we come from? Why are things the way that they are. That is the purpose, not to say this is exactly what happened or how it happened, but to say this is who created and this is what God created and this is why God created. So the first chapter of Genesis is this epic sweeping story of creation, everything that exists. The chapters we're going to look at today are Genesis 2 and 3 and they're focused more on the relationship of human beings with God and with each other. Especially focusing on a particular question. The question is, why is life so hard? Why is there suffering and death? Why do we experience these kinds of things? It starts with the question of why we are here. You know, and it begins with, with God saying, I, I have created you for a purpose, to take care of each other, to be a helper for each other. 
to uh, take care of creation. We're connected. One of the things that we miss in, uh, when we read this in English instead of reading it in Hebrew is, is the connection of the words. Um, when they talk about Adam and, and Eve, we're not talking about personal names like Mike and Susan, all right? Uh, uh, the word Adam is simply a word that means human, all right? And sometimes we capitalize it and we turn it into, into someone's name. Uh, but it's a, it, it, in Hebrew, it says God made Adam out of Adama. Uh, Adama is a word for, for the, the dirt, the ground, all right? So Adam is made out of Adama. Uh, we are part of creation, the same stuff that all of creation is. We are connected with that. The name Eve simply means the one who is living. So you have the human and you have the living one. Um, and to these, then we talk about how does the world work, right? And we find sin enters into the world. And it's not because it's the fault of those two people. It's a way of saying this is what happens. This is part of the human experience. For any of us, for all of us, they represent who we are. We're here to care for the earth. God has given us all that we need. All we need to do is trust God. Trust the promise that God will take care of us and be there for us. Well, into the story then comes this talking serpent. We heard about this story. It's another clue that this is not a literal story, but uh, heavily symbolic. What, is this, what does the serpent do? Right? He plants a seed of doubt. He doesn't really tell any lies. He simply asks the question. He says, can you, can you really trust God? God said he would provide for you. Can you really trust him. The language they, they use is that of eating fruit, of, of a tree of, of knowledge. Growing up, I always, I, I assumed that it was an apple, but I was surprised when I read, actually read the Bible, that doesn't say an apple, it doesn't say apple, there's nothing about apples. Apples don't grow in, in that part of the world. Um, it, it, was, it happened just when, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, because the Latin word for apple sounds like the word, the Latin word for evil. Um, they almost sound alike. And so artists said, oh, let's, let's, make, it, let's make it an apple uh, because it sounds like the word evil. And so for some whatever reason, we think it is. But it was, it was, uh, it's not really about the fruit, right? But the fruit, the tree, is, represents for us is choices that we make. Um, now for me, growing up, I thought, well, I, I don't get this story. Why is knowledge a bad thing? Talking about knowledge of good and evil, that sounds like a great thing that we should all have. Why did God not want them to, to have this knowledge? Um, for what, what it represented was it's saying, this is what God has you know, to guide us and help us. Uh, people said, if I had it myself, I wouldn't need God. And so that's where the danger came in. It says, if this knowledge of good and evil replaces our need for God, then it gets in the way of the relationship that we have. Just because we have knowledge doesn't mean we know how to use it, right? A young person can physically drive a car before they're 16 years old, but we don't put them, you know, behind 2,000 pounds of, of metal and say, good luck with that. We say, no, you need experience. You need time. Even though you have the knowledge of how to do this, you need practice. You need wisdom. You need patience. These kinds of things that happen over time in order to know how to use this knowledge that you have. We know how to split the atom. We know how to splice genes. That doesn't mean we should be doing those things. Too often we learn the hard way of when we start to play God of what the consequences can be. But when the, when, the, when the serpent talks to the woman, he talks about when we, when we take the place of God, when we replace our own effort, our own knowledge with, with God, then he says we die. We're cut off from the source of life. Um, they didn't, you know, when they ate the, the apple, they didn't drop over dead immediately. Um, but things were never the same again. Something, the relationship died, right? It was, or it was wounded terribly. The story then is, God, how do I repair this, this wounded relationship? Now, Adam and Eve know immediately that they've messed up. Their failure to trust God messes up this good thing that they have, and so they experience something that we all try to avoid. They experience shame. And they do what any of us would do when we feel ashamed. We cover up. We hide. 
We, we, we pull back. We disconnect from others. We disconnect from God, and that can be a very lonely place to be. When we behave badly, we, we know it, right? Uh, and we try to hide. Uh, some of you, if you had kids, you probably know this experience. When they've done something bad, you find them hiding somewhere in the house, right? Because they know that they've done something bad. They don't want to face you. They don't want to talk about it, and so they'll hide somewhere. Uh, we do the same thing. Uh, we hide in different ways. We hide in our work. We hide in our addictions. We hide in our fake smiles and others' masks that we put on. We put distance between us and others and God so we don't have to face this. But it doesn't work, right? We know that hiding does not get rid of shame. In fact, it makes it, makes it worse. So God doesn't let them hide. God comes searching them out. God loves them too much to let them dwell in shame, to hide somewhere. He seeks them out, knowing full well exactly what they've done, but he still asks them, you know, what, what happened? Why are you hiding? Because he knows until that they confess, until they recognize, until they say what they've done, they will never be free of it. What God is doing is replacing the experience that they have of shame, of saying I'm a terrible person, with an experience of guilt. Now, now it may sound like, the, aren't those both bad things, shame and guilt? But they're, no, they're really, they're really different. We don't always distinguish, but they're very different kinds of things. Shame says, I'm a bad person. I am bad. Guilt says, I did something bad, right? If you've done something bad, you can be forgiven. You're not a bad person. You just did a bad thing. Shame has to do with our identity of who we are. Guilt has to do with the actions that we've done. God says, you need to face what we've done. Obviously, there's consequences for actions that we take. But God seeks us out so we know that we are not alone. The relationship can be saved. Um, I don't think God was shocked or surprised by Adam and Eve's actions or by our actions. When you give someone free will, there's always a possibility that they are going to choose to turn away. They're going to choose to say no. That's a risk you take when there's free will. But our poor choices are not the things that define us. Because sometimes we, we, eventually all of us do that. One time or another, we're going to make a poor choice. But what this story reminds me is that our poor choices are not the things that define who we are. We are and always will be children of God. And, and God says, I'm not going to let your poor choices somehow ruin everything. I'm going to find a way for us to rebuild this broken world, this broken trust, uh, to restore that. And that's really the storyline of the Bible. It happens right at the very beginning. We've got this broken, and we call it the fall, all right? The, where sin comes in, we fall from grace. And this process then of God sending messages and witnesses and prophets and, and Jesus himself to find a way for us to rebuild this broken relationship of promises broken. I want to invite you into the story um, these next nine months. Not just listen to the story, but somehow enter into the story itself. And there's lots of ways in which we can do that. Let me give you one example. I want you to pull out your, pull out your bulletin. There's an insert in there. Um, looks, looks like this, just a little half sheet kind of thing, all right? Um, it's, it says, sharing God's story at home. Because one of the things we realize is that if you only hear something one time, you say, oh, that was interesting, and you go on to the next interesting thing in our life. I find you know, if we want to integrate it into our life, we need to talk about it, we need to think about it, we need to come at it in different ways. And so what we have is each week we're going to have a little sheet like this that's going to give you some, um, uh, some things. It's going to give you a, a scripture verse of the week. Um, just uh, each day to read one verse, the same verse, help bring that home, remind us what it is that we talked about. Um, and, and here's an idea, a mealtime prayer. Some, some people um, uh, do come Lord Jesus, be our guest. We do that 99% of the time. You know, but every once in a while it's nice maybe to have a different prayer to help us think in a different way. Uh, and so here you may want to say, let's take this home, let's put it on the table and one of the kids or whoever wants, why don't you read the prayer for us today? And we can do a, a mealtime prayer. 
If you want to have daily readings, we've got readings that are going to connect up as we tell the whole story of the scripture between today's reading and next Sunday's reading. There's stuff that happens. If you want to be up to speed what's going on with that, this will give you a daily reading each day of the week to help do that. And then a, the way, a, a service challenge, a way to somehow, how do we take what we've learned and talked about and put it into action? Um, this is a way that the story becomes not just a story we heard at church, but this becomes, God's story becomes our story. Uh, and the back side of this is simply, you know, something we call about devotions. Um, if you wanted to do family devotions, and I don't know what that will look like, that'll look different in every family. When I say family, I'm talking not just about mom, dad, and kids. Family in the broadest sense of the world. Family, you can be all by yourself because you're connected to the family of God. But to say, I can do this on my own. Um, you know, maybe if you've got little kids, this might last five minutes if you, uh, you'd pare it down. Or if it's something that, uh, as a larger family or as adults, you might get, have a great conversation and find yourself half an hour uh, doing this. Um, but it gives you the tools. You know, what would we, what, how would we begin? How would we Get the piano and just pull the plug on it. Um, so it gives you things, how would we begin? How would we end? What would we do in the middle? What would we talk about? You know, and this gives you a guide. So again, not enough to everyone to do this exactly it is, but these are tools to use that we can make this, that we can make this our own. So let's practice. Like, uh, so on the devotions page, uh, under gathering, there's a prayer of the week. Let's just try that. Let's read that together to say, this isn't hard. We could do this. So let's together pretend we're a, one big family and say we're going to gather. We've lit, a, we've lit a candle. We're going to say we're going to celebrate here and let's start just by praying this prayer together. Promising God, you've created us and all that exists. You have not left us to be alone, but you have kept your promises to be with us and provide a community where we can love and be loved. Help us to make promises to you and to others and help us to keep our promises. Amen. Lots of ways to get into the story. Let me just close with another one. Each week we're going we're gonna to post a, a video that we're going to have. And so this is something you can watch at home. You can use it as part of your devotions. Uh, we're going to have it as part of our life. So um, um, this gives you an example of what it looks like. So part of God's story is about the first time people stop trusting God. It's called the fall because it's all about how we fell away from God. It begins like this. When God was done creating a perfect world, the first two humans, Adam and Eve, got to live as a family in a beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. They explored wherever they wanted and took walks with God. And God took care of them like a loving father. The Garden of Eden was a perfect home. In fact, Adam and Eve were so free, they didn't even wear clothes. God wanted everybody to be this free, with no shame or embarrassment. Imagine no death, no secrets, no fighting, no fear, no pain, no loneliness, no anger, no bullies, no sadness, no hunger, no getting left out, no crying, nothing bad, ever. This is God's dream for all of us, but part of being free means we get choices. And the first bad choice happened in the Garden of Eden. See, God gave Adam and Eve one rule. Do not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. God knew if Adam and Eve ate this fruit, they would think they knew everything good and didn't need God anymore. They would stop asking God to take care of them. And they would know about evil, which means they would hurt each other. Sickness would come. They would get old and eventually die. God didn't want any of that to happen. So he told them not to eat the fruit. Now, you might be wondering why God would even make a tree like that in the first place. Why give Adam and Eve a chance to know how to ruin the perfect world? But remember how being free means we get to make choices? God wants us to choose to obey because we love him, not because we have to. And for a while, Adam and Eve chose to trust God and obey him. After all, it was perfect in the garden. 
But one day, an evil serpent decided he wanted to separate Adam and Eve from God. So he came up with a plan to make Eve think God didn't love her. He said, does God really love you? If he does, why won't he let you eat this juicy, delicious fruit? Eve told the serpent what God had told Adam. If they ate the fruit, they would die. The snake told Eve that God was lying. The fruit would only make her smart. Being smart sounded great. So Eve bit into the fruit. It tasted so good, she gave some to Adam. He ate it too. Well, they didn't drop dead on the spot, but things started to change. First, they realized they were naked and felt embarrassed. Before eating the fruit, they only felt happy. Then they heard God coming and ran away. They had never run away from God before. God knew what happened, but he still asked Adam, did you eat the fruit I asked you not to eat? Adam said, Eve made me do it. Eve didn't like being blamed. She said, the serpent made me do it. Really, they had both made a choice to disobey God. God was so sad they chose not to trust him. They had to move away from the beautiful garden. Worse, pain and sadness and death came into the world. It was no longer perfect. This could have been a horrible end to a really sad story. But guess what? It's not. God loved Adam and Eve, and us, so much that he planned a great rescue. Many years later, a rescuer would take the punishment for every bad choice ever made. And because of this rescue, God would one day make the world a perfect home for us again. And that's the story of the fall. So in case you missed it, here's a quick version. God made a perfect world. There was one rule. The serpent tricked Eve. He made her doubt God's love. So Eve broke the rule. Adam broke it too. All the wrong things in the world started. But that's not the end. God really did love them. And all of us. So he began a great rescue plan. And that's a part of God's story. All right, so each week, uh, I'll send one of these out on Wins, uh, on Friday when you get your, uh, your electric newsletter. If you say, I want to watch the video of the, of the Bible story that's going to be on Sunday, it's a way to get a preview of what it is. Or uh, on Sunday when you come home, you say, what was the story we talked about on Sunday? Oh, I forgot that. Well, let's, let's look at the video. Remind us, what was the story that we read and heard? So the, again, this is a tool we can use uh, throughout the week to somehow make the story become part of our story. Let's get the band back up. Let's sing. And invite you to, to rise. Everyone invite you to, to get up and so we can sing a song. It's a song about, um, about relationship, that we are not alone, that God has uh, called us and made us.